Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DMs Guild review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. With this video, I'll be reviewing the DMs Guild sourcebook, The Molded, Humanoid Ooze Sourcebook, designed by Richard James Arrington for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your DMs Guild shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to my platinum patrons, Andrew, Brian, Richard, and Joe. And gold patrons, RPG Paper Crafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marcos David Vicente Gilberto, Sean, aka Cert2B, Adam, Dead Lizard Lounge, and Alkshi. Thank you all very much for your support. Now, I have read and reviewed a number of player source books, a number of custom races. Uh, some of them have been quite exotic and strange. Perhaps none of them quite as exotic and strange as a humanoid ooze. So the molded, as described here, are oozes that were transformed into sentient humanoid oozes, uh, usually as uh, to be servants. So pretty much like golems. They're created, they're magical constructs created by wizards from oozes. And as you can tell by the uh, original artwork here, at least I believe it's original, um, they kind of resemble, uh, I'm reminded of like uh, like Clayface from Batman. Uh, when, I, when I first pictured a, 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 a sentient ooze, like a humanoid ooze, I was picturing, um, there's like that Marvel character that's got like the skeleton inside of, it's like a floating skeleton inside of a blobby form. I forgot what that character's called. Um, basically, you know, kind of like a gelatinous cube always looks like that. Where it's got like shit floating in there. Uh, but instead, they look more like um, golem, just golems that are slimy, uh, essentially. Uh, but I like the way the mouths are kind of all sticky and nasty looking, so uh, I'm digging that little artwork there. Uh, what this is, is it is a single player race source book. Normally, if you see a source book with player races, they're usually containing a couple different races, usually surrounding some kind of a theme. Uh, this one only has the one race, although it does have multiple subclasses for that race. It is a very, very unique race, and it has a ton of traits, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, we also have backgrounds, we have racial feats, and about half of the entire source book is comprised of a original one-shot adventure involving the molded, and it's not a bad way to introduce the concept of the molded into your uh, campaign, although I have some misgivings about the way the uh, adventure itself is created. But let's jump in and take a look at the molded. Whoops, that's too fast. Too fast. All right, so the molded, as is written in here, are a complete magically constructed race. So they have no real society, uh, and they're very, very like alien creatures in that they don't uh, they don't eat, they don't sleep, uh, they don't breathe. I mean, they're essentially undead when it comes to all of that. They have no concept of money uh, or morality or reproduction. It's just role-playing this would be, it seems like an extremely challenging, maybe a, a welcoming challenge for many, but uh, it's a very, very, very exotic alien creature compared to everything else. Uh, and if you're playing as a uh, player cra crafted version of the molded, then obviously you've probably broken away from your servitor status because most of them are created to be servants in the same way that golems are created. They just they grabbed a news, they stuck it in this machine called a uh, grand mold, and created this humanoid ooze. There's an odd rule where they only last for about 30 years, and then they are essentially killed. Their soul is destroyed or something, and then they just revert back to a normal ooze. I have no idea why that was put in there, but that's part of being a, a molded. Not only is that part of it, but the molded apparently know exactly when they're going to die. Uh, they know like how much time they've got left, which is very, very odd, but apparently also fuels their need to kind of explore and see the world and all that, which, hey, that's what most adventurers are all about, so I guess it makes sense that they're going to be adventurers. So the molded uh, traits are a little bonkers. Uh, the, their constitution score is increased by four. That's huge. Huge. Automatically makes them big old tanks. Uh, however, their charisma score decreases by five. That's a huge decrease. You could already see, so mostly when we have races, we're adding or subtracting one or two numbers. In fact, I believe the base player's handbook took away with subtracting numbers, as in previous D&D editions. It's now just additions. It makes everybody just a little more powerful. So if you have a race that actually subtracts anything, 
then you're automatically going to be on a lower playing field than everybody else. Not only does your charisma score decrease by five, but your strength, intelligence, and wisdom decrease by three each for a total of, let's see, what is that, 14 points lower on your ability score. for uh, So 14 negative and four positive. That is awful as written on paper. So you'd have to have some really big trade-offs. And already I'm not a fan of the extreme ability score changes here. Uh, usually the best player races that I've seen just slightly tweak things around. It seems boring on the, on the surface, but those player races are so well balanced at this point that one of the best things you can do is just take an existing one and just slightly tweak it. If you start really messing with the formula and going through and having to change all these other things, that creates just compounding issues. Um, so right now, you're at a severe, severe disadvantage for literally every single type of character except for dexterity builds. It's the only thing that hasn't been decreased. So your only options, again, if, assuming you want to create a decent character, obviously you can roleplay whatever you want. You can create those uh, certain challenges and stats however you feel like and that's fine and I think that can create a lot of interesting characters but most folks are going to want to at least create something that is at least somewhat viable uh, in combat because let's face it one of the biggest pillars of playing d d is is combat is being able to uh, survive and do things in a combat encounter uh, and with the molded, I don't know. You're just a, you're a big tank without any kind of offense. You could be like a dexterity based build. I actually made uh, just as a test. I went through and made a monk uh, molded because that seems kind of you know you're punching your fists and things. Um, and they had a mess of hit points, but they only had an AC of 12 and only a plus three to hit at level one, which is real nasty. So you're well, we'll get into the other thing. So you're at a disadvantage, but. You have damage resistance. You have built-in damage resistance to acid, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, and immunity to psychic damage. You are essentially permanently in barbarian rage mode without having to actually spend any kind of barbarian rage or keep attacking. That is an, the other side of things. That's a huge advantage. You give players resistance built-in straight up. Those are easily the most common damage types coming at you. Uh, and automatically you're taking half damage from everything. Now, you're probably going to get hit by fucking everything unless you have uh, some good armor on, and it, that's also going to be a challenge, as is written further down here. Uh, but that's these are already very, very challenging things to feel like how they are going to balance everything out. You are amorphous. Like an ooze, you can move through a space as narrow as one inch wide, but any items or equipment uh, is left behind. So this creates another challenge for DMs in that suddenly does your... Play, does your Party not care about locked doors anymore because your ooze person can get through fucking anywhere. You know, there's a one-inch gap in almost every situation. Uh, you know, these are not vacuum-sealed doors and areas, so even a vault room would probably have a one-inch opening somewhere uh, that the ooze player could squeeze through, and then who knows what they could do on the other side. Now, that could create some challenges that the DM could work around, like, oh, well, now your party's separated. You can't actually open the door from that side, blah, blah, blah. But still, that player's going to get around to friggin' everywhere. Um, corrosive strikes maybe is less as terribly unbalanced as everything else. Your base uh, unarmed damage is 1d6 acid damage plus your strength, but your strength is going to be garbage because of your ability score decreases. You have a corrosive body, which sounds cool. Uh, you know, you think, okay, maybe other people will get damaged if they attack me, but no, what it actually is is that you need a special coating to cover any kind of materials that you use because literally you will do acid to all of those, although it doesn't mention if anybody kind of grapples you or grabs you that, that, that it does damage. It, that's not built in. Instead, it's just if you try to use equipment, any kind of equipment, it starts to basically dissolve from your acidness. So you have to be able to coat everything. Mechanically, what it does is it means every single piece of item or equipment you use costs twice as much, which that's a fascinating balance issue because obviously if you give an ooze character uh, some great armor to make up for their horrible AC then you've created a really extremely tanky character who has a ton of hit points, has good AC, and damage resistance. You're just not going to fucking kill this guy. Uh, or it, I guess, because Molded literally have no sex. Um, so, yeah, you've, you have to code it. It takes twice, as, uh, twice, the mater uh, twice the value of the weapons or armor in question. Uh, although I believe when you create one, you start with, like, 100 gold of this, like, special powder. So, uh, character creation, if you're not 
paying for good heavy armor. If you have some kind of other build, then that's fine. But obviously, you create some good armor, and you're you're good to go. You are just super tanky, and you can squish. Now, you can't take your armor with you if you do a little squish move. That's an interesting caveat. You have ooze sight. You have blind sight up to 15 feet. Oh, this is so crazy. This is like if... I don't know, I came to the table and there was some, you know, that one player who's always trying to just break and bend the rules as much as possible to squeeze as much power out of whatever ability they're using that they can. Everybody's got that player. If that player just came to me and made an entire race full of like, well, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I'm just like, whoa, slow your roll. That's way too much stuff. You're level one. Everybody else is going to be falling behind. You can't, it's just too much stuff. And I feel like that's that's the problem we've come up with we've come up on here there's just way too many abilities even though there are some detriments to some of these abilities like that coding you have to put on your equipment and obviously the horrible ability score decreases i just feel like there's there's too much going on here and the fact that you don't have to sleep you do not suffer from exhaustion you require no food water or air so automatically all of these environmental survival challenges that everybody else has to worry about the ooze player doesn't have to worry about at all which is also crazy it does say you have to spend four hours of of like light activity to to actually replenish your spells and abilities but still that's that's just bananas okay they have disadvantage on perception checks beyond 60 feet fine but that's is that a trade-off for blind sight to 15 feet i think everybody's taking that trade-off uh, are you kidding me? <laughs> you can just essentially see in the dark perfectly fine. They are colorblind. Okay. Uh, the sub races, it's interesting to have it. Uh, they're basically elemental based, although you've also got a shadowy one. Um, everything I just mentioned is for the standard molded. So on top of that, you can also be a black molded, blue molded, or red molded. Uh, the blue and red are very, very similar in that they either change their unarmed strike to either cold or fire, and they can innately cast, obviously very thematically, either cold or fire spells. For example, the Red Molded can cast Firebolt Cantrip. When they reach 3rd level, they can cast Burning Hands once per day, and then when they reach 5th level, they can cast Scorching Ray once per day. Uh, they also gain a movement speed of 40 feet, whereas the Blue Molded just gains a straight-up built-in plus 1 AC. Both of those are pretty damn great. Uh, and automatically seem way better than a standard molded. Uh, the black molded um, gains resistant to necrotic damage, uh, and all these ones that gain resistance, they do gain a vulnerability to the opposite one, which I think is interesting. Um, and you have a uh, advantage on stealth checks and stealth expertise. However, you have the very, very crippling disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks in daylight. You're basically a drow, uh, which obviously creates some very hard difficulties. So, I don't know. It seems... Uh, it, it's a really neat idea, but it feels just wildly unbalanced. Now, it's very, very hard for me as a reviewer who's just reading this to comment on balance. I get it. I totally get that. Uh, all I can do is look and see and evaluate what I read on paper compared to everything else I've read and make a judgment call. And this one, it just feels like there's too many extremes balancing one extreme to another extreme to where this character plays wildly different and i guess you would expect an ooze a playable ooze to do that but the stat increases just and decreases seem too extreme and the resist damage resistance and trying to make them pay more for equipment and all these things just seem like a really compounding convoluted uh character design i did like a lot of the details that were given here um the molded are given their own background which is really nice to have anytime i see a new race or class i do like to see the actual uh uh, role-playing supplements, addition to that, so you've got your little D6s and D8s table for um, personality, ideals, bonds, and flaws, which are all pretty good and have to do with the fact that these molded are specifically created as, like, magical servants. Um, they all tie in pretty well with this. The racial feats, so this is a new concept that was introduced in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is different uh, races can pick from specialized feats based on their race. Um... And in the case of Molded, obviously have very, very unique ones that all feel really, really cool. And this is where I feel like a lot of those innate traits maybe should have actually become feats. Because at that point, uh, you have to pick and choose which feat you want, and you can only have so many feats in your career. Um, so maybe things like the uh, ability to squeeze your body into an inch or something, you know, maybe that should have been a feat instead of a built-in trait from level one. Or damage resistance, same thing. Like, you know, take off... Take off less of those built-in traits at the beginning and make those into feats, and I think that would have been a better balancing solution. As it is, a lot of these feats are very, very cool. Uh, you can be see-through, which gives you advantage on stealth checks. Uh, you can detach your eyeballs 
and uh, either put them or put them somewhere or throw them somewhere, and that literally you can uh, see out of that eye as if you dropped it somewhere. Kind of, you know, there's a lot of fun uh, movies and shows that do this with characters that remove an eye, usually some kind of undead or something. They can still uh, see out of that eyeball. Uh, that was in the was in the Toy Story movie, wasn't it? Where she left leaves her eye behind and she's literally seeing out of it. The Mrs. Potato Head character. <laughs> I didn't think I would use a Toy Story reference in a DM's Guild review. Um, but that's a really neat idea, and it, it's fun that that's an actual uh, uh, a feat that you take. Uh, my favorite, of course, is the molded weapon, which essentially turns your uh, molded ooze into the T-1000 from Terminator 2. You can turn your uh, arm into its own blade, uh, which gives you a built-in plus one magical weapon, does 1d8 uh, plus one plus your strength, although your strength is going to be pretty bad. Uh, it does note that you can actually take a lot of these different feats multiple times uh, if you wanted to, and they just kind of stack, which is kind of interesting. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them do have uh, uh, stat prerequisites, and as we know, your stats are going to be really, really bad uh, to start with because of that minus three. So you'd have to have really, you'd have to really kind of plan ahead, uh, like third or fourth edition style, uh, if you want to actually achieve some of these feats, especially at level four. But I feel like it's better. Uh, balanced because you do have to wait until level four to get your first feat, and then you only have them every uh, four levels, and that's assuming you you know stick with the same class and don't multi-class. Um, but I think they're really cool. The molded embrace, of course, is the classic gelatinous cube move where you can just um, push somebody into you. Although instead of them taking acid damage, um, oh no, it does say that uh, they take a one d eight damage. Sorry, and they're unable to breathe, and you can still like hit them when they're inside of it. And if other people hit you then they get disadvantage if they don't want to hit their buddy. If they just take the regular, then they have then half the damage goes to them, half goes to the person you've consumed. All of these feats are really, really fun. I wish more of the built-in uh, traits had been pushed into these feats and made it uh, a little better balanced. Uh, the other thing that's included in the molded, which is not something I see very often at all in DMs Guild source books and supplements, is an adventure. There's a one-shot adventure that takes up pretty much the entire second half of this otherwise very, very short one race uh, supplement called The Sticky Situation. And it's uh, designed to introduce the concept of the molded into your campaign. And it's, it does a good job of being able to easily kind of drop it in somewhere with the caveat that uh, you actually go to like a dormant volcano uh, to a village near a volcano and then kind of a, a wizard's house. So that's a very kind of unique, exotic uh, location that feels like it would be kind of limited in where you could put it, even though it says um, uh, you, you should be able to put it near Waterdeep. It, it is well organized like the rest of the entire adventure. You can see it's got the nice kind of standard um, artwork and layout of a uh, officially published uh, source book or module. It, the way it's broken up between the introduction and uh, giving multiple adventure hooks uh, a nice summary, and then dividing it all up into different parts based mostly on the location and what's happening. All of that is very well organized, easy to read, easy to parse. The problem is I was very confused about who the characters are, what their motivations are, and what exactly goes down in part two and three. I feel like there needed to be like a dramatis personae as well as just a little bit more information. It feels like it's long enough, like it's each, each one is a page, and this is supposed to be a pretty short one-shot, so it feels like just looking at it, it would be long enough. But the problem is, part one is given almost too much attention, uh, and then part two, and th which is just basically them learning about this adventure, and they have uh, an encounter with a bunch of fire newts. They figure out why are these red-molded servants not coming to this village to help. And they journey to this uh, auction house, and it turns out the... Wizards, who's the wizard is having this auction house to sell off a bunch of molded servants, but it turns out that his brother has transformed the real auctioner, um, Elias, into a molded. So apparently, you can put a human into the molded machine, it creates this really freaky, like oozy uh, person that's like unrecognizable and they lose all their memories and everything is really messed up. Uh, and then he's trying to like get into a vault that belongs to the brother, and there's an imp involved that's kind of evil and behind everything. I was very confused about like who the characters are, what's going on, and all that information. Things that as a DM, if I wanted to run this adventure, I would want to know. Um, there's other characters here. There's a which is the funny part. There's a gnome with two minotaur bodyguards who tries to steal the uh, the grand mold uh, forge. There's a bunch of orcs who just kind of end up putting up a fight because they're orcs. And the end ends, uh, it culminates in this big 
fight scene among all these different parties in the auction house, and you're supposed to discover, you know, the brother's situation, and that ends up being a big fight. There's a big arena with a bunch of molded fighting each other. Like it's, I don't. It feels like there's just like either too much going on, or just not quite enough information about how this is supposed to play out. And the compounding problem is there's no maps or visual aids of any kind for the entire adventure, which also makes things a little tricky because it talks about it talks about areas as if you're supposed to be able to pop around in different ones and learn different things in the small auction house area, but without, and maybe it's just because I'm kind of a visual learner when it comes to that, but I really couldn't picture uh, at what point players are supposed to learn things and how, what's the general flow of how this works. So I guess I like the idea behind an auction house for molded and then kind of this weird like prestige switcheroo about there being like a twin brother or something involved who's evil, but there was not enough background information about the villain's plot and motivation, and then I was just confused about the general layout and flow of how things happen. There was also one even more confusing aspect, which there are stat blocks for NPCs, which is very nice to have, uh, including ones that are just found in the uh, player's handbook slash, or uh, monster manual slash SRD and it's just good to, whenever I see those repeated instead of just an annotation saying, hey, find this in the Monster Manual page 47 or whatever, uh, it's good to have these in here. But there's a mention of uh, three molded that specifically attack the players because they were made by the imp, um, which, again, I'm, I'm confused about the whole imp situation. But their names are, um, let's see, what were their names? There were ones that were uh, a red molded named Rage, a blue molded named Revenge, and a black molded named Death. They're the only ones that will really pose a threat to the adventurers as the rest are just kind of level one. But if you look in their stat blocks, uh, there is no stat block for Rage, Revenge, and Death. There are stat blocks for War, Pestilence, Famine, and Death. So clearly there was a change at some point being made where they wanted to do this, obviously, Four Horsemen thing um, with the molded. And they've all got, like, really cool, you know, their CR4, powerful. It really shows off the molded in a fun way. Um... They've all got their unique abilities. Uh, some are built like a monk. One is built like a rogue. Like, That's a really neat idea, but I was very confused about, okay, wait, there's these three characters named this, and then there's four stat blocks here for these. Obviously, they're supposed to be analogous to each other, but I don't know at what point something changed. This is kind of something that should have been obviously fixed in editing, so just kind of a weird little uh, issue there. Again, I like the idea behind... Inclu- I really like the idea of including a one-shot adventure with a uh, supplement that shows off the elements of that uh, supplement quite well, uh, which in this case I think it does. Uh, and in fact, the players even have access to a Grand Forge. Uh, they could get a Grand uh, Grand Mold, sorry, and then they could create their own molded, or they're rewarded with molded after that, which are like these weird, you know, golem servants. Um, so I think that part works well, but it just needed a little bit more work and other pass through it. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for the molded humanoid source book. Uh, Pro, it does provide detailed information on creating molded, including their creation, their society, and their traits. There's a lot of great uh, information in here for creating them if you want to do that. Uh, Pro, there's a new molded background with multiple tables and several interesting racial feats. I do really like the racial feats in there. That is a new concept that just arrived, not just arrived, Xanathar has been out for a little bit, but I have not seen other uh, source books take advantage of racial feats like this one has, and they're all really, really fun and interesting. I think that's a cool addition. Uh, Pro, I do like that a one-shot adventure was included, and I think it does a great job introducing the molded to any campaign. Uh, Cons, the molded have extreme ability score changes and borderline game-breaking abilities and resistances at level one. It just seems like too much, even if... You know, and again, I haven't play tested it, so even if they've found that this does balance everything out in the end, it just feels like it's you're swinging one way or the other. Like you're trying to balance this um, this soup, and you just put in like all of the spicy material, and then all of this unspicy material. You know, just it's too much. Just make more, a little bit of one, a little bit of the other, and that'll balance everything out. You don't. It's it seems like there's too much going on, especially for a level one character. Cons. No maps at all for the one-shot adventure. That's a bummer. Um, And it it really feels like it needed some kind of map or layout because I was confused just looking at it. And then cons, there was even some confusion regarding the NPC names and stat blocks uh, in the adventure that I didn't even realize until I went and looked through the stat blocks. Final verdict for uh, the Molded. The Molded Humanoid Ooze Sourcebook provides all the secrets of the ooze, including questionably balanced traits, subclasses, feats, background, and even a one-shot adventure. 
Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. And you can follow our own D&D &D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.